The Conservative leadership race is underway with tougher requirements this time around for potential candidates. Joining me now in studio to discuss this is Dr. Jeffrey Hale, political science professor at the University of Lethbridge. Welcome back to BCN. Good to be with you, Hale. Okay, let's talk about the potential candidates here for the Tories. Uh, Peter McKay's name, Marilyn Gladue, Aaron O'Toole, but there's also a social conservative, a Toronto lawyer by the name of Leslyn Lewis. What do we know about her? Uh, she is from Jamaica originally. She's been here since she was five years old. Uh, she's focused on getting her education, her, her professional credentials. Uh, she's a practicing lawyer, and she's got a PhD in international law from uh, Osgoode Hall, so she's nobody's dummy. But does she stand a chance against the big names, the big stars like Peter McKay? Practically, no, but uh, the purpose of newcomer social conservative candidates is to be a place for people to uh, park a vote, uh, signal a policy preference, and send a message to the party leadership that there is a block of, vote out, block of votes out there that you ignore at your peril. It seems, Dr. Hale, that it really is a two-horse race at this point in time. Peter McKay, Aaron O'Toole, but some pundits say that Peter McKay really has the edge. What do you think gives him the edge? I think, first of all, name recognition, uh, the fact that he has been around for a very long time, uh, secondly, he has money in organization. He put the full $300,000 deposit down, from what I understand, uh, which is a fair bit of money to part with at any one time. Uh, everybody else is having to work to raise that money. Right. Uh, I think the, the, the third factor is that he is seen as somebody who might be more appealing uh, to the liberal vote in Ontario and to parts of Atlantic Canada. As many people argue, he's not a blue Tory, he's really a red Tory. I think that is a Did reasonable, I think that's a reasonable assessment. Uh, he is a purely pragmatic politician who will go wherever the wind is blowing. So what do you think it's going to take for the next person to become the leader of the Federal Conservative Party? Is that they have to be maybe socially liberal but fiscally conservative? Uh, I don't know that you have to be a thoroughgoing social liberal, but you have to be able to appeal to suburban and small town Ontario, which will be the difference between winning and losing in all likelihood at the next election. Uh, you have to be somebody who can articulate consensus conservative principles effectively. In other words, if you are not, a, not somebody who can communicate well and communicate with uh, some sense of the public good, you know, conservatives have to work harder to win trust uh, outside their core support. And being able to explain what you stand for and why is important. I think the third thing, and this we learned from Andrew Shear, is that you have to be comfortable in your own skin uh, before you can make other people comfortable to you. If you can't relate to yourself in public, it's going to be hard to get other people to relate to you. How about being fully bilingual? How important is that? The reason I ask that is because of what happened with Peter McKay recently, and they had in one of the papers in Quebec, good luck, mister, when he tried to speak en français, and you know, it didn't come out too well. Uh, you have to be functionally bilingual. Uh, the uh, Quebecers and French Canadians generally uh, are about a quarter of the population. And just as any community wants to be treated with respect, being able to speak to a quarter of the population in, one of, in the other of Canada's two official languages and make yourself understood, uh, I think, is, is necessary. Do you you have, want, it, you it will not help you win Quebec, but it will get you a hearing in Ontario and New Brunswick. Oh, interesting. Now, getting back to social conservatism for just a moment here, Dr. Hale, how much do, of a role do social conservatives play in some of these leadership elections? Uh, I think they're a significant proportion of the membership. Uh, and as such, in a one person, one, a weighted one person, one vote environment, uh, they, can, they can be a, a, a sizable group of votes. They will not all go in the same direction. But if they think you don't respect them, the same as any other community uh, in, the, uh, in the country, if they think you don't respect them, you, you know, you, you're not going to get their vote by default. So do you think the big two then, uh, Peter McKay, Aaron O'Toole, and maybe even Marilyn Gladue will stay away from the hot button issues like you know, gay marriage, abortion, pro-life versus pro-choice? I think they will try to avoid those because uh, those, are, those are areas where the mainstream media will beat up on them. I think. Uh, their capacity to appeal to social conservatives will uh, depend on 
whether they are seen as people who can be trusted to protect uh, their interests against uh, the dominant liberal worldview that says they're deplorables who don't need to be uh, respected at all, mm -hmm. and uh, that particularly with uh, first-generation Canadians, uh, that that you you show that you are comfortable with their values in their community because, frankly, for those people on the religious side of the social conservative movement, uh, there there are a great many new Canadians who who instinctively and uh, identify with those values. Why do you think it is that uh, so many politicians are pressured into marching in gay pride parades? Oh, it has become a litmus test for what the the left describes as tolerance. That's interesting. That's very interesting. You know, and, and Aaron O'Toole said he's not going to march, not because of the fact that he doesn't support gay marriage, but because the police are never invited, like the Toronto Gay Pride Parade. Hmm. That's his out. Peter McKay says, yes, I'll definitely march. Well, I, I think the notion of tolerance uh, is, uh, tends to be a one-way street in certain parts of our society. We see that uh, periodically at the university, and uh, <clears throat> you, don't expect, you, you don't expect from others what you're not willing to give yourself. How about some other potential candidates like uh, Rick Peterson, the Alberta businessman? Does he stand a shot? I mean, putting down the 300K and saying, you know, I'm in. Well, he still has to get the 3,000 memberships. He may get that. Yeah. Uh, he is an articulate and, uh, and, and passionate individual. Uh, and if he can get the memberships, he will have a voice. But how much he can, how much he can break through uh, in given the fact that you have to go to 338 constituencies, is an open question. What do you think the next Conservative leader really needs to win the next federal election? What qualities, characteristics? I think you have to come up with a vision that treats um, Canadians as more than just a bunch of fragments that you are trying to put together uh, based on pollsters' advice. Uh, we no longer, I think Jacques Parizeau was right. We are no longer a country in the traditional sense of the term. We are deeply divided uh, on multiple levels, region, ethnicity, language, secular versus religious, and so on and so forth. And we see that uh, with the way so many regional conflicts are reinforcing multiple solitudes in this country. Somebody who can bridge those solitudes in a respectful manner mm -hmm. and make people feel that the person can identify with them uh, will, will, will go a long way. Maybe that's why a lot of people like Stephen Harper at the time when he was Prime Minister. I mean, he was from Toronto. He went to university out there, but then he grew up out, out west here in Alberta, so he had that connection to both Central Canada and the West. And. I think the capacity to relate to people in different regions is critical. And, uh, and it's not simply a matter of hitting hot button issues, because that can be seen as pandering as well, uh, but rather saying this is what we have in common, and it's, uh, it's not just the lowest common denominator, but it involves aspirations for things that the average family can identify with. Let's talk about the pipeline protest, the uh, railway blockade set up all across the country here. Uh, many people wanting to support uh, the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs, even though it's already received the LNG pipeline project, the approval of the band councils, the local band councils. Why is the prime minister using and enforcing the rule of law? It's crippling our economy, these protests, the blockades. I think the reason that he hasn't sent in the RCMP is that he is concerned that if it escalates further, he can't deal with it. And the only way... To bring in the army? They tried that at Oka and it didn't work very well. Mm. And I think this is part of the problem. We have a... We not only have a group of people who feel left out of the country, but we have a group of people who will use them to project their own agendas and their own interests independently of the well-being of Native peoples and First Nations. And uh, that, uh, given the solitudes that I talked about, means that if you can find a way of working with First Nations leaders to try to diffuse this, 
it's probably a better uh, foundation to get resource projects built in the future. Uh, and than, towards reconciliation And as well. towards reconciliation. The mm -hmm. fact that the idea that we're in it together as opposed to being eternal solitudes. So I, f I have tremendous sympathy for the Native communities that have worked hard to ensure that their people's interests are represented uh, in development projects. And I think it's really important to encourage that so that we have a win-win approach to development. Unfortunately, we have uh, certain groups in society who take a zero-sum view of this stuff that if uh, we don't get our agenda, it doesn't matter if anybody else is better off. Speaking of uh, big projects coming up, the Tech Frontier Mine in northern Alberta. Many people say if that doesn't go through, if the Liberals kibosh it, you're going to hear a lot more talk of Western separation, Alberta separation. What are your thoughts? Tech has become a symbol, uh, and unfortunately it's a negative symbol on both sides of the regional and ideological divide. Uh, to get past this problem, uh, there has to be something in it for everyone. And uh, in as much as tech has played by the rules, there is a tendency in Ottawa to change the rules every time uh, the, uh, uh, every time the political winds change. And given the fact that it takes 10 to 15 years to get any major project done in this, in this country, that is a dreadful signal to people you want to invest in future because it means you cannot be trusted. At the same time, uh, there are many people who feel there has to be a visible commitment on emissions reduction. Uh, what that looks like is open to negotiation. A lot of that negotiation is going on behind closed doors. So I think each, for, for tech to go through, there has to be something on it for all the different actors in the process. Um, the suggestion to approve it on the assumption that it will never be built is too cynical by half. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, unless we can find a way to address environmental and climate change issues at the same time as we do development, uh, this country does not have a future. Alberta's separation sentiment is at an all-time high right now, especially if tech falls through. But you're saying talk like that can really scare investment away from our province, like what happened with Quebec many years ago. Well, we are a resource-based economy, uh, and while I think it is important to start the longer-term process of transition to reduce the overall impact of resources in the economy, that, does, that shouldn't mean putting people out of work today. But if you separate tomorrow, if you can't get your products to Tidewater mm -hmm. in, a, in the existing federation, what makes you think that you can get them to Tidewater uh, as, another as a separate country? Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, if business people do not think they can get their product to market, they are not going to invest in this, in this province. Uh, Quebec decided to make that up by having the government invest in all sorts of things. Uh, that's how we got Bombardier and their eternal subsidies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the company that has been molting subsidiaries, uh, like uh, you know, shedding like a dog coming into a warm house from the cold. Okay. And, uh, and you know, this has been happening in that province for years. The government has started to move away from that mm -hmm. in, recent, in recent years and the economy is a lot stronger for it. I but think. didn't it take like 30 years for their economy to rebound after all the talk of separation where it came so close to well, separating? Well, Lucien Bouchard did a study in the late 90s showing that investment per capita in Quebec was 30% lower than the rest of the country. And uh, that is what his economists called the, sep the, you know, the, the separation fear discount. And uh, Alberta, as long as the energy industry was doing well, was, uh, had a far higher level of investment per capita, which is why Albertans have the highest incomes of uh, you know, any, uh, any provincial residents in the country. You know, the minute the industry went south, uh, we still had a lot of people who were being well paid, but those people who were at the edges of the system found that there was no safety net there. 
And right. we, have, we have to diversify, but it's not something that happens overnight. You have to build an ecosystem where people f feel that they can invest for the long term, not just for the quick buck. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau spent a lot of time visiting countries in Africa trying to win support uh, for this UN security seat. How important is this really for Canada? Or is it a waste of taxpayers' dollars, really? It depends how much credibility you attach to the UN, uh, both for, as a place for projecting Canadians' interests and a place to uh, work with other countries to support Canadian values. Uh, and right now, uh, the UN does not have the strongest track record in either area. Uh, there are a lot of people who view this as a vanity project. I think if we are contributing to good governance in Africa, if we're contributing to uh, economic opportunity in Africa, that's a good thing over the long term. Uh, but uh, the kind of games that countries play in order to get the votes of authoritarian governments uh, generally don't lend themselves to those outcomes. Political science professor from the University of Lethbridge, Dr. Jeffrey Hale, thanks again for joining me in studio today. Thank you.